Let's open the Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. Now, we, we did a couple of these uh, a few weeks ago and uh, talked about the levels of discipleship. We're going to do it again today. And I want to recap some things and I want to take us a little further to remind us that it is important as Christians to grow and then to give us a benchmark to shoot for. In your Christian walk, you have to realize that you don't just get saved and then there you are for the rest of your life. That's like a baby getting born and then plop, we put a pamper on them and then plop them down and never do anything with them. No, we expect babies to grow up. Babies have to grow up. Baby Christians have to grow up. And so every Christian needs to know that so you have something to shoot for. Because sometimes parents aren't telling, helping their kids grow up. But we are here. So Ephesians chapter 4, let's just get reminded. Ephesians 4. Start with verse, well let me just recap and then we'll get to the, well verse 11. He himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles. This is where he gave the preachers to the church. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So he gave the preachers for a reason. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man. Underline the perfect man. If you're using a, a, a cell phone... I don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> Hopefully your Bible app can highlight scriptures for you. And if it can't, then you need to find one that can. <laughs> to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ. Now just notice that again. Speaking the truth in love may grow up. Everybody underline the word grow up. So the goal is to grow up in all things. So God wants us to grow up. So you can tell somebody in the spirit, grow up. Now, here are the levels that we've discussed already. I want to run through them because we'll recap. It's important for you to recognize it's in every individual has to recognize where you're at in growing up in God. Every, every one of us has to recognize where we're at in growing up in God. And it just means you've got to shoot for something high. The first level of discipleship or of growing up is the level of salvation. Everybody needs to get saved. The second level is spiritual hunger. The third level is to be a server in God's kingdom. The fourth level is partnership, where you begin to partner with God. It's a little more responsibility there. You're hooked up tighter to God. And then number five or level five would be deep intimacy with God. Deep intimacy with God. So those are the five levels. Let me run through them and, and, and uh, expound just a little bit. The level of salvation is where we experience the promises of God. That's where we get delivered from stuff. That's where we get delivered from a godless life. Get saved and we're happy to be saved. Now some Christians stay there the rest of their life. They're told that you're saved, once saved, always saved. That's all you got to do. Well, no, that's not all you got to do. God wants you to grow up. Amen. Now we're not talking about getting to heaven. That's another story. Usually people just want to get to heaven and live their life godlessly. But that's not good enough. Amen. God's real and He's good and He wants to be close to us. So you need to get saved, sure. And then He'll pour His goodness on you. He'll get you delivered from sickness, disease, and depression. He'll get you, uh, you know, uh, prosperous. He'll fix your finances. He'll fix part of your life. He'll fix some relationships. He'll help you see some things. But then at some point you've got to get hungry for God. You've got to get really... Some people show up to get healed. God healed, never show up again. Some people show, and I don't mean show up to church, even though that could be, but show up to God to get saved and healed, and now I'm happy, now I'm going to live my godless life. No, you're supposed to at some point get, get spiritually hungry. Now I want God. And as you begin to see what's, what's out there for you, what, what your future can hold with God, it should make you really hungry. In my life, when I came to the Lord, uh, part of the reason I came to the Lord was because I heard a preacher talking about number five. He was talking about deep intimacy with God. What does that mean? That sounds kind of strange. Is that what those really religious people do? Intimate with God? Well, intimacy with God is what I heard on the radio. I was listening to a cassette tape. Out of my speakers was a conversation that a certain preacher was having with God. And he said, 
And I said this and to God, and then God said this, and then I said, and then God said, and then I, I said, He's, who's he talking to? Yeah. Yeah. And I rewound the cassette tape. I thought, did I miss something? Did, it, did I just miss something? He's preaching. He's talking to a friend. And it turned out he was talking to God. Amen. Now, I've heard a lot of people talking to God, <laughs> but I ain't never heard of God talking back. I thought this life was just we toss stuff out into the nebulous zone and hope that it sticks and who knows if he heard. Pray thousands of words hoping that one sentence was correct enough to get up there. That's how most people pray and that's how most people live their Christian life. Never knowing enough about God to pray right. And especially never knowing enough about God to hear back from Him. And so that was, to me, that's deep intimacy. I heard a man in a conversation like with a friend. You know, Abraham was called the friend of God. You ever felt that before? If you haven't felt that you're a friend of God, there's another level for you. And that's the reason we need to see some of this stuff. And so for me, I heard that and I thought, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I might be slow, but I calculated pretty quickly that hearing God speak to me as a friend is worth everything in life. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I had a lot of stuff, and I had a future planned for a lot more stuff. Yeah. But I figured that hearing from God one time, if, he just, if I could just hear one sentence from God, that would be worth everything in the whole wide world. Amen. Every achievement, every friend, every fun thing, just hearing God speak to me personally would, would just blow everything away. Amen. Well, that's level five. That's a walk with God where you're intimate with God. Like God said in the Bible, he said how, he was about to do something to Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, but I can't hide the thing I'm about to do from Abraham. He's my friend. I, I like that. I want to be there. Right? So that caused me to get to level two, which is hungry for God. I see men and women of God that knew more than me and that walked closer to God. Ah, ah, I got to get hungry for God. Spiritual hunger is necessary. Because only the hungry people get filled. Amen. When you're not hungry, you don't drive around frantically looking for a fast food restaurant. Right. When you're not hungry, you're not running into the kitchen. When's it going to be ready? Right? Yeah. And guess what? If you're not hungry, you don't eat. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. Some people probably do. and shouldn't. Smith Wigglesworth said the worst that can happen to a Christian is to be satisfied with one's spiritual condition. The worst that can happen is to think, whatever level you're at, to think, I finally arrived. I'm there, got saved, whew. or I learned the Bible, whew, read the whole Bible in one year. Whew. No, you can't be satisfied where you're at because this whole walk with God, you'll never know Him perfectly until you see Him, but you can get real close. Our goal is to understand Him and know Him as best we can right now. And that takes a lifetime of, of searching and seeking. Amen. So only the hungry people get filled. Praise only the thirsty people get the water. Amen. Isn't that right? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Only the hungry people can actually get saved. You've got to really want to get saved to get saved. You've got to really want to get healed to get healed. I, I've, I've needed to be healed several times. And almost every single time, now, now the, the, the method was different, the, the timing was different. Every single time, I really wanted it. Then there was other times when I just said, okay, in the name of Jesus, I'll be healed. You know, I hope I'm healed. Heal me, God. And it, you don't get anything that way. Little careless, uh, half-hearted, uh, just half-hearted prayers don't get anything. You've got to seek Him with the whole heart. Isn't that right? I remember one guy came to the church when we just started the church and he wanted to be filled with the Spirit. And he was newly saved and he was excited about God and he wanted to be filled with the Spirit. And so I said, well, just meet me at the church. You know, he didn't want to wait till Sunday, basically. And so he met me at the church and after hours and I talked with him and prayed for him, he got filled with the Spirit and spoke with tongues right in the office. And we got in the, he was leaving and I left after him, locked the door and got in my car. And I don't think he saw me get in my car, but I was sitting there and I look over and he's in the car in his pickup truck next to me. And I see him, he's just, he just frantically praising God. He's so excited, just shaking it all over the place. He was so thrilled Hallelujah. to have gotten filled with the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Because he was hungry. Because I knew had what had happened and he was really wanting this really badly. 
So when you want something and then finally get it, you're pretty happy. Isn't that right? So get hungry for God. And if you're not hungry for God, hang around us for a while. Come to church just a tad more. Let me give you a taste of the steak. You know, how many of you in here have eaten filet mignon? How many have not eaten filet mignon? If you haven't eaten filet mignon, you don't know what you're missing yet. So you're just sitting there thinking, whatever. Isn't that right? Or some dessert. Somebody comes up and says, oh, God, you never, you got to try this. You're thinking, yeah, whatever. This my, my so-and-so cooks a such and such. It's so good. You're like, yeah, okay. I've had that before. You got to get, you got to get, you got to taste the word of God. You got to taste the truth a few times. Isn't that right? Some little careless childhood, you know, they don't know. You take, you give them the best batch of green beans ever. <laughs> They don't have a taste for that yet, right? Yeah. Some people don't know what's good for them. But you'll, they'll never know what's good for them until they try it. That's right. So that's why we like everybody to taste and try the Lord a lot. Amen. So we've got to stay hungry. All right. Next, we've got to serve God. You gotta, you, at some point in your life, you're going to have to serve the Lord. At some point in your life, you're going to have to uh, plant yourself in a church where you can serve people. At some point, you'll never be spiritually healthy. You'll never grow any further if you're not willing to serve God. Amen. You can't just be, you know, a spiritual giant on level five with intimacy at home. I'm intimate with God, and I, He shows me things, and I tell everybody what, what's happening. And No, you're just kooky is what you are. <laughs> oh, no, I, just, I'm a, I, I sit at the house, and I just pray and do these funny things, and... And then I tell everybody and I send emails out to people and tell them all the wonderful works of God. No, if you're not in church serving God, you hadn't even gone past level two. Amen. Sorry. That's good. But you're in here, so I know everybody in here is okay. You're okay. I'm not talking about you guys. <clears throat> the worst that can happen is to think that you're at level five when you're only level two. <laughs> But serving people is the heart of God. Jesus serves people. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. And so until you step into the shoes of serving others, and it could be, you know, a menial task at church. It could be, a, you know, some grand thing at church that, that requires a lot of time and responsibility. Uh, it could be serving God not necessarily in the building, but serving people elsewhere, serving Christians, serving your fellow. You know, you've got to be in church to know somebody across the aisle. You find out they need to move and they need to help. They need some help. Well, you go help them. That's serving God. There's all sorts of ways to serve God. And you can even serve God with email. But at some point you have to kind of put yourself in a place where others uh, count on you. That would be serving God. If no one's counting on you, you're not serving God. Does that make sense? If no one counts on you to show up for your whatever, then you're not really serving God. And you can serve God witnessing. That would count. Serving God witnessing is included in level two, where you begin to, to, to share your faith with others. Now I'm serving God. I'm promoting the gospel. I'm sharing my faith. I'm helping someone else get to God. The, level three in serving is where your calendar changes. Your calendar changes. And Sundays get some marks on it. Other than, you know... Wild time at the lake house. <laughs> at some point you have to go through that. I went through it. See, when you first get saved, you're not a church person. When you're first saved, you're, church is the last thing that you do during the week. And so you think, well, I, I guess I'm supposed to go to church, so you try it. And then at some point you go, I'm, I'm going to go regularly. You make that decision. I'm going to go, didn't y'all make that decision at some point? Yeah, yeah it's a decision. You, I'm going to go every Sunday. Or usually people start off, I'm going to go every other Sunday. <laughs> but at some point you realize that's not quite enough because you really want to get closer to God and you really want to get further in the things of God and learn a little faster. And so finally you're going every Sunday. And then at some point you decide, I'm going to go every Wednesday. It's the Wednesday night crowd. I know I'm safe. <laughs> but I remember in my life I had to start canceling things on the weekend because I was responsible at church. I had committed my, myself there. Before I even had some, I didn't have a title. I, I wasn't really all that special on a Sunday morning, but I knew that certain people ex, 
they, they thought I would be at church. And to me, that was response. I, I was then, someone was counting on me. They just they thought I would be there. I better be there. Yeah. I was excited about the Lord. I knew that that's, that was good for people. And that's all I knew is that my smile, my excitement was good enough to make me go. Amen. So your calendar changes. <clears throat> your time and your money change. At some point, you have to decide to tithe. At some point, your income uh, has to be given back to the kingdom of God. That's a big commitment. But we'll save that for another day. Level four is partnership. <clears throat> That's where now I don't make a move without God. Partnership is where me and God lock arms. And I don't make a move unless I know He approves. I'm seeking His will before I make my decisions. I, I'm really sincere about getting into and staying in the perfect will of God. To be out of the perfect will of God is absolutely unacceptable. Amen. My conscience Amen. is tender at this point. The inside of me is tender to the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't do anything if it's going to hurt the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Partnership is where I feel His heart. I, I know what, what He likes. I'm, I'm really close to Him. Very, it's very important to me not to step out of line with the Lord. See there? Partnership is where leadership begins. Not that you're supposed to be some grand, you know, name at the top of everything, but just leadership, just being trustworthy with other people. Trustworthy to point, direct, and help other people. Partnership is where you're supposed to be. Does that give you something to shoot for? You know, some, you know the conscience of man is very important. And the further you go with God, you realize that you can't violate your conscience or you won't feel right. When you neglect your Christian uh, works, your duties, your, your, your prayer, your, anything you neglect that you really think the Lord would like you to be doing, it begins to grate on your conscience. Or if you sin, you know, outright, well, that's going to mess your conscience up. So you start, as you get closer to the Lord, you start realizing your conscience is very important. If your conscience is not secure, then you're, you're flimsy. Your life is weak. And the things you do that aren't right, you know, you, they start bothering you severely. Uh, and that's the, you know, when, when you're awakened unto God, when, when the light shines, it's kind of like you have, everybody has a sheet. I have my light, my, a big white sheet is my life, or we could say my conscience. And I have this, I get saved and the light comes and I realize I was dirty. I needed to be saved. Or I am dirty. I need to be saved. I get saved, my sheet turns white. Amen. I'm perfectly cleaned from sin. Now that's a good feeling. The light is bright. I can see clearly that my sheet is clean. Hallelujah. Now the goal the rest of your life is to keep it clean. And you keep it clean by doing what you know to do. And also, if you messed up, you get forgiven quickly. Amen. You rely on the blood of Jesus because I know all of you guys uh, have blown it before. And specks of dirt get on your sheet. It's, you're supposed to catch that quickly. At level four, you're really catching it quickly. When you're really in tune with the Spirit, you catch dirt quickly. As soon as it comes out of your mouth, you know it's done. Uh, I blew it. You see the specks of dirt easily when you're walking in the light. Walking in the light just means walking in the word that you know. Amen. The rest of your life, you have to keep it that way. You know, the, one of the... Johnny reminded me of this the other day, that <clears throat> these levels of discipleship is not something you, you start and graduate from, and now I'm done with that, thank God. Then you graduate. No, these things, they, they build upon one another. Amen. So you never get rid of your salvation. You never stop rejoicing in it or accessing the promises of God. You never stop being hungry. You never stop serving. You never stop partying. So it's not something you just graduate from. It's just you graduate right. on, in, whatever, Amen. upward. Amen. The problem is if you don't stay in the light, you, you walk out and you kind of get lukewarm in the Lord. You kind of fall asleep a little bit. See, when my eyes are wide open, I can see. If I get a little groggy, I can't see good. When you first wake up, it's like, if you go back to sleep, you won't be able to see your sheet. You won't be able to, you, you're, you won't be tender to your conscience anymore. 
You can't see if you got any dirt. And so people walk around pretty much dead in Christ. Somebody approaches them about the Lord. And they're like, oh, I'm okay. Everything's okay with me. They can't even see that they are full of dirt. They can't even see that their, their life is so far from God because they've closed their eyes. They can't see their conscience anymore. But when you walk closely to the Lord, your conscience is tender. That's the point. Does that make sense? And I'm not talking about just, i got to be good, i got to be good. I'm not talking about that. Uh, though we're going to talk about being perfect, it's not about trying to be good and not doing bad. It's all about getting close to God and walking with God. Amen. With a goal of, you know, this life on earth is about me and God. Yes. It's not about God just helping me do my natural life better. Oh, God, please let me do that. Oh, God, please. Oh, God, do this. Oh, God, do that. Oh, God, I just need a little. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, I got a big thing. Come and do that for me. No, it's not about you just trying to get God to fix your natural life and, do, and let you live it. It's about you looking to God and partnering with God and enjoying that. Amen. Thank you, Lord. For God to hear my prayer and answer it to the point that I know He answered, not just, you know, accidentally something happened and we say, well, thank God. I'm talking about where I know He heard and answered, where a miracle happened, or where I heard Him. That, that just changes the whole ballgame. Then it's special. Even if you pray to get healed and actually get healed. Well, I'm glad that you're healed. But what was even more special is that the Holy God said yes. Is that the Holy God came in and partnered and said, yeah, sure. Okay. Level five is intimacy. This is where you really get close to the heart of God. You kind of exemplify Jesus Christ. People get around you and they feel like they've been with God. Right? Now, that's a good place to be. But it, only come, it doesn't come because you faked it. It doesn't come because you wore a suit and tie. It doesn't come because you used religious words. It doesn't come because you quoted Scripture. It doesn't come because you left your Bible open at the house when friends came over. It's because you had such a closeness to God that His Spirit kind of rubbed off on you, and so you just kind of exemplify isn't that wonderful? Amen. Jesus said, I and them and you and me, Father, that, we, that they may be made perfect in one. So it's like we do, you, once you get so close to God, you're just all intertwined and you can hardly tell you apart. So let's talk about perfection. Turn with me to Matthew 5. I want to just read some perfect. Uh, excuse me. Oh, Matthew 5 is fine. Matthew 5, then we'll go to 2 Timothy 3, and then James 3 and Psalms 1 and, and Hebrews 6. Or if you pray real hard, I'll just quote them to you so you don't have to fumble through the Bible. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Here, here's, here's, now this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the beginning of Jesus' teaching ministry. And this is basic Christianity, okay? Sermon on the Mount's basic, one, you know, teaching 101 for the Christian. And so here's what he says, but he does allude to some things that you... So you don't have to wait 10 years to be perfect. You don't have to wait 10 years to be intimate with God. Amen. You can grow really fast in God if you're serious about it. You can learn just like that. You can hear Him speak to you first week, third month. First year, you can be very intimate with God, okay? But it does require some things of you. But here's what Jesus said, verse 43. He said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. This is basic Christianity. Has anybody ever been made fun of? persecuted, told off on? Anybody ever cursed you? Anybody ever got really mad at you? Mistreated you? Harmed you? Didn't think of you? Inconsiderate of you? Anybody ever do that to you? What are you supposed to do to them? Verse 45, that you may give them the what for? <laughs> no, he said, love your enemies. Bless them if they, if they curse you. If they, tell all, if they tell a lie on you, what do you do? You bless them. You ever done that before? Oh, God, just do a miracle in their life and bless their socks off. 
They told the biggest lie off on you. They made fun of you. They mis mis miscalculated you. They, they gossiped about you. And you hear about it. What's your first response? Oh, God, just do a big fat miracle for them and love them today. You ever done that before? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> See, we're growing up in the Lord here. This is, what Je this is the heart of God. This is what Christians do. See, you thought Christians are those who, go, who uh, do religious stuff all the time. Actually, real Christians are those who do this. Verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father. It just means that you may be like God. For He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He'll, he'll even feed a sinner. He'll even let a sinner get a suntan. Verse 46, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, uh, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Did you see that word perfect? Do you, do you, th you mean God wants you to be perfect? I thought nobody's perfect. I thought we get to hide behind that tree. Isn't that, what, isn't that what this culture does with the word perfect? Doesn't it mislead people? Well, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. You approach someone and say, well, you know what? What really maybe you should have done? Oh, nobody's perfect. Like, don't, 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 even, don't mess with me. Nobody's perfect. What are you supposed to say? Okay, go on and be rude and sin and just be ridiculous if you want to. Okay, thank you. I'm not perfect. You know, I'm not perfect. God wants you to be perfect. He wants you to be perfect. You can be perfect. Amen. As long as you don't think perfect means never made a mistake. So we know that nobody's perfect if that's the definition. Never made a mistake does not equal perfect, though, in God's eyes. We know everybody makes mistakes. But you can be perfect if you're willing to say... When someone approaches you and said, Ugh, you say, oh, sorry about that. You're right, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. That means you're perfect. When you're able to repent quickly, catch yourself, what it means is you're, you're, you're striving to stay real close to God. It means that you're really wanting to live up and exemplify Jesus Christ, live up to and exemplify Jesus Christ. So you've got to repent quickly. No hiding behind, well, I'm, nobody's perfect. Have you, don't ever say that. Don't ever say that. You're supposed to grow up in Him. Okay. Hallelujah. See, that's going over real big tonight. <laughs> but you know, just a little, you have to find a way to apply, apply this scripture. Now we've learned it, we heard it, we've read it, not even in a Hallmark card. It's really in the Bible. Like, for instance, verse 47, if you greet your brethren only... What do you do more than others? Even sinners greet their brethren. He wants us to be even better. I mean, I drive around Houston, and, and if I see people and, and, they, and, I, and, they, and their eyeballs meet mine, driving around my car, just waving at everybody. When we first got married, Joni's like, why are you waving at them? It's like, <laughs> just strangers, you know, I, just everybody is a human. <laughs> I went to Kenya, Africa on a mission trip. And uh, I was working with a pastor in a church and people everywhere. And, you know, the, over there, you know, they're, they're not in cars, most of them. They're walking or riding bikes or horses or donkeys or whatever along the side of the road. I'm waving at everybody and they're just, they're not even looking at me. Then when they do look at me, they're not waving. I'm thinking, how come they're not? And I watch the Christians leave the church and they're not waving. The pastor wasn't waving at everybody. I don't know how he missed this scripture. I'm not judging him. I'm just saying. I just recognize, you know, I'm just trying to do what Jesus. It felt good to greet another human. See, that's a heart toward people. God has one of those. Boy, what a blessing to see a smiling uh, driver in Houston. 
Let's shake somebody. They'll, they'll drive off thinking, what is wrong with that person? They were all happy and smiling and waving at me. Do I know them? <laughs> Turn with me to 2 Timothy 3 now. 2 Timothy 3. Second Timothy 3, it's where all the T's are. T's, Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus in the New Testament. Second Timothy 3. I know, I know you've probably got this one marked in your Bible, but it's good to see it sometimes. Do y'all want, want us to start putting scriptures up on the board up here? I'm hearing different things. Make them look them up. What else? <laughs> if you want them up here on the screen, pray hard. We'll see what happens. But we do like you to see it in your own Bible because at home, you're not going to have the screen. You need to be able to find it in your own Bible. That's why you've got to be able to mark so you go back to the good stuff. Not that it's not all good, but there's key things that you have to be able to find in, in times of need. Verse 16, 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. To, so Scripture is profitable. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? <clears throat> that the man of God may be complete. King James says perfect. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the word perfect means mature, and it means complete. It doesn't mean never make a mistake, ever. It means mature and complete. So you can be perfect. Everybody say, I can be perfect. Can be perfect. Matter of fact, I'm just going to declare it by faith. I am perfect. I am perfect. I am perfect. I am perfect. I know when you said that, uh, another voice out here said, you liar, you liar, you liar. <laughs> and that's why you have to say that several times to overcome the voices from the outside or your brain that doesn't understand that yet. Yeah. But you, until you see yourself this way, you'll never act it. Until right. you see yourself exemplifying Christ, being like God, you'll never act like it. You'll never Amen. think like it. So you have to say it until you start thinking it right. <clears throat> okay. Turn with me to Colossians, which is to the left, just a few pages. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Colossians 1, 27. It says, To them God willed to the saints... God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Just wanted you to see Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is that Christ lives in you. So when Christ lives in you, it's not about you trying to do all these things. It's about you just giving up to Christ. Amen. Letting Him be Lord of your life Amen. and letting Him... See, He is the Word of God. So we could say all Scripture is given to fix you. Or we could say Christ is given to fix you. If you're close to Jesus Christ, then you're close to His Word. Amen. So Christ in me, or the Word in me, the hope of glory, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. What's Paul saying here? Paul's saying, I am working hard to present you perfect. You understand? The goal is to pre get presented perfect in Christ Jesus. So we all have something to shoot for. Turn with me to James chapter 3. James 3, which is after Hebrews, towards the end. Remember in Hebrews chapter 6, it says that we should not lay again the foundation. See, every, we build a house. We're building a spiritual house of understanding. And we're not supposed to have to go back to the beginnings. Not laying again the foundation of 
uh, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the laying on of hands, doctrine of baptisms, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Let us go on unto perfection. Let's not lay the foundation again. Let's go on unto perfection. James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. Excuse me, I shouldn't have read that one. Verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. What does that mean, stumble in word? means if you can keep your mouth shut, Hallelujah. you're called a perfect man. Hallelujah. How's that saying go? It's better to keep your mouth closed and let them think that you're stupid than open it and remove all doubt. <laughs> if anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. And so this is where the, the believer has to get so filled with God that what comes out doesn't stumble. Out of the abundance of the heart. This is not about you, you know, holding it in. I wanted to cuss them out, but I held it in. <laughs> no, this is about in your heart being so filled with the love of God because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If cuss words are in your heart, or, or let's say this, if cuss words are coming out of your mouth, it's because they're in your heart. If hurtful things, anger, resentment, bitterness is in your heart, it's coming out of your mouth. If what you're saying is not edifying the room, then it's because your heart doesn't have edifying things in it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, you can't help it. I can get around people for five minutes and know exactly what's in their heart. You don't know what's in my heart. Yeah, I do. You can know what's in people's heart by what they say. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. It's a good way for you to judge your own life. Amen. What's coming out of your heart, I mean, what's coming out of your mouth gives us a picture, gives you a picture of what's in your heart. Yeah. If worry and fret and fear and uncertainty and chaos and bitterness and, and confusion and hatred and I hate this and I hate that, if it's coming out of here, it's because it's in you. We can just end on that, right? We're not going to, though. Before anybody took a big sigh of relief, we're not ending there. You just have to, you have to figure this spiritual stuff is truth. This is more real than what you think you live. This stuff is more real than what you think you live. It's more real than your circumstance. It's more real than all those memories you have. This is more real than everything. So if you're able to uh, bridle your tongue, you're a perfect man. Hallelujah. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they're turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. A little bitty tiny rudder can turn a, turn a ship. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. One little spark can set it off. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it's set on fire by hell. Stop there for just a second. Notice this term, it sets on fire the course of nature. Your tongue can blaze a trail of blessing or cursing. Come on. Amen. Your tongue can cause victory in life. That's it can right. cause defeat in life. That's right. Well, I don't know what I want to do. You just bla you're helping you, you, you blaze a trail for defeat. How about I know what to do. God will show me for certain. I'm so confused. Headed for destruction, set on fire by hell. The devil is confused. The devil doesn't know what to do. The devil is, he's striving. He's panicked. We're not supposed to be. So our tongue can speak like the devil or it can speak like God. Verse 7, For every kind of beast and bird, every reptile, creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil, except we can. Full of deadly poison, with it we bless our God and Father, and, and with it we curse men. 
with whom, whom, who have been made in the similitude or likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. So he's saying that the natural man does this. The natural man will bless God and curse people. The natural man, is he, he, he's half good, half evil. That's why sinners sometimes feel like they're good. Okay, yeah, you got some good there, but you're half good, half evil. You ought not be half and half. When you get saved, you're whole. Amen. Out of the same mouth, then verse 11. Does a spring send forth water and bitter, fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grape, grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. How can good stuff and bad stuff come out of your heart and mouth? It's not supposed to happen that way. Stop there. The tongue, you, you think, well, what do my words mean? Well, that's like saying, well, what is a rudder going to do? It's going to turn the whole thing. You have to, if once you understand the laws of physics, then you see how running through the water, that rudder can do anything to that ship. Once you understand the laws of faith, you'll, you'll realize how powerful your words can be. Amen. These are laws that work. You put right words on your life, you'll head the right direction. Thank you, Lord. You go in and out, that's like trying to get a ship to go this way, but you're, you turn it this way, and then you turn it that way, and you just all... That's why when you, when you decide something that's right and of God, that you're trusting God for, or shooting after, or hungry, or I want this, then you set your course and don't touch it. You set your course and you hold steady and you only say the right thing even if, even if all hell is coming, even if the troubles are not stopping, even if it's getting darker, the direction you're headed. If you know it's the will of God and the direction you're supposed to go, you hang on and you don't budge from it. Amen. It's like when we set these uh, air-conditioned thermostats. We walk over that thermostat and we set it. We want the temperature to go to that degrees. <laughs> But if you go over there five minutes later and turn it up and down and up and down and switch it back and forth and up and down and up and oh my gosh, it's not getting there. Just leave it and it'll get there. Thank you, Lord. Set your course with your decision and your faith and your words and don't budge from it. Amen. Well, we're trusting God. He's going to come through us and, and, and take care of the bills and give us some extra. We're believing God to start this thing up. And then next morning, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna, we're going to do. What are we going to do? Call them and let's pray. we got to pray. <laughs> you're undecided. You're double-minded at that point. You don't get anything if you're double-minded. Double-minded people are always flipping up, they're flipping the thing. Trusting God, I don't know if I am. I trust in God, I think I am. I wonder if I am. If, you, if you'll set your thermostat and just leave it, then all of heaven, God, the Holy yes. Spirit, the angels of heaven, yes. begin working yes. in your behalf yes. to bring the temperature to what you desired. That's right. Amen. But if you're going to go flipping back and forth and not sure with your words and not steady with what you say, not steady with what you believe, the angels are like... So-and-so needs to be healed. The angels are like. <laughs> Somebody's trusting God. Glory to God. And then mother-in-law comes over. <laughs> Na neighbor comes over and says, oh, come on. You don't believe in all that old healing stuff, do you? I don't know. The angel stops. You got to decide. Don't budge. Amen. And you don't have to argue with people. people no, very few are going to believe the Bible to a T. Yeah. You stick with those that do. Amen. Very few are going to believe the Bible. You don't have to argue with those people. You don't have to convince those people. You don't have to preach those people. You don't have to make them believe like you believe. Matter of fact, you need to quit trying to force people to believe what Come you on. believe. Yes. Amen. Somebody comes at you with doubt and unbelief and all sorts of 100,000 wrong things that you just... You learned Sunday was the truth, and they come at you with all these things. You just look at them and... 
Just smile real big, walk off. You know the truth. You keep it in you. Don't fight with people. Don't get into arguments about that. Don't let the devil throw you off. He'll try. Don't let the devil throw you off about the truth of God. Yeah. To get miracles, you're going to have to stand in the face of the... You're going to have to stand right in the front of the devil himself. To get miracles to happen in your life, you're going to have to be bold and courageous like a lion. You're going to have to stand there and grit your teeth. You're going to have to be willing to get in that ring with the, the problem, the devil himself, the doubts, the worries, the fears, the people, and just keep your eyes locked on Glory. Jesus. Glory. If the devil throws a punch, you throw two punches. Someone tells a lie off on God, you quote three scriptures. Amen. And you got to stand there until those thoughts subside, until all those, all those encroaching darkness and, and destruction stop. You have to stand there until they all shut up. Amen. The only way to make those things shut up is you can't let them get the last word in. That's right. That's right. It'll never happen. Amen. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? That's ruined a lot of people. What are you going to do if that's the devil? God doesn't spook you. That's right. <laughs> that is so good. Well, what are you going to do if the, that's the devil? Amen. That's good, Pastor. Your Heavenly Father will never spook you Amen. to move you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, that's good. I thought it was good, too. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, we don't have to continue much further. Let me just quote a couple more things. One time Jesus met the rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler said, what do I need to do to get saved? Jesus said, you've got to obey the commands. He said, well, I've done that. I've obeyed the commands from my youth. He quoted a few of them. Jesus said, okay, there's one thing you haven't done. If you want to be perfect, go sell all that you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. Okay, so there's times in your life you're going to have to recognize you're growing, you're learning, you're, you're achieving, you're getting somewhere with God, you're very happy about it. Uh, you've practiced what you've learned and it's come to pass and you're feeling pretty good. Uh, just be ready. At some point, He's going he's gonna to make you open that one last closet door. Let, let's get this one, open that one last closet door of your, it could be a pride thing, a self thing, just some special place, some special desire, some special pursuit you have, some needy thing that you think you need more than God almost. Could be a little pet sin, could be a big sin, could be a whatever it is. He's going to make you open that one last door that keeps bothering you. That door keeps bothering you. Whether you admit it or not, that one last closet door bothers your spiritual life. And He's going to make you, just like He did with the rich young ruler, there's one thing you haven't done. If you want to be perfect, open that. He's going to get down to the bottom of your heart if you'll let Him. This is growing up. I mean, this is really growing up in God. <clears throat> One time, Hosea, the, the prophet, he said this about a certain city. He said, Ephraim is a cake not turned. They'd gotten into disobedience, done some rebellious things, and he called them a cake not turned. Now, most of us here, us young folks, we don't know what in the world that means. But in the old day, sometimes they would cook a cake next to a fire, and you just rotate the cake and let it cook the whole thing through. But if you just set it down and don't turn it, then you only cook one side of it. That's like many Christians today. They learn a few things, and they rejoice in a few truths of God, but they never grow, and so all they have is one side. So their spiritual life is just, they got one side going. One side is healthy, one side is right, but they, you get around them and they, you realize something's wrong here. Make sense? We need to get completely grown up in God. We need to get fully cooked in the Lord. Amen. Let Him address all of your life. Let's open up the whole Bible. Let's get all of our heart on the table. Let's, fix, let's get all of our spiritual insufficiencies fixed up by God. Amen. So we're all responsible for that. And that takes time. You know, you've got to spend a little time sitting by the fire on a certain area. You've got to get cooked it takes a little time to get cooked on every side. Some people never turn, and so they get burnt. <laughs> so you get around them, and they got three pet doctrines, and they just dump them all over you. Here they got 50,000 things that are just completely contrary to God in their life, but they got three pet doctrines that, oh, they really believe in, and they'll just hammer you all day long about those. <laughs> 
And it's one of those things. I don't, I don't want to eat that burnt cake. <laughs> so don't be like that. Okay. Deuteronomy 8, don't turn there. I'm just going to quote him. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Psalm 101 verse 2 says, I will behave myself in a wise and perfect way. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Hallelujah. Closing the book. I really enjoy talking about spiritual growth. Everybody can grow. Everybody should grow. Everybody's called to grow. There's no better life, no, no funner existence than growing in the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. If you're in Houston and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we are certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. For more information about God, salvation through Jesus Christ, or this ministry, please visit us on the web or download our Houston Faith phone app.